You can begin. Hafadei Samsu. Oops. Hafadei Samsu. Thank you for your participation in today's virtual public hearing. This virtual public hearing is convened by the Committee on Heritage and the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Forgotten Revitalization, Self-Determination, and Regional Affairs. For the record, in accordance with the open government law, public hearing notices were given to all senators, stakeholders, and all main media broadcasting outlets. With the first notice postponing the previously scheduled meeting on September 29th, 2020 to October 6, 2020. That notice was sent out on Wednesday, September 28th, 2020. The second notice was sent on Sunday, October 4th, 2020. The virtual public hearing notice is also posted at the Guam Legislature's website at www.guamlegislature.org. Today is Tuesday, October 6, 2020, and the time is now uh, 5.39. This virtual confirmation hearing is now called to order. Sidhuis Maasi for your virtual attendance at this evening's hearing. On the agenda for this afternoon, or evening rather, uh, virtual confirmation hearing are the appointment of Simone E. P. Bollinger to serve as a member literature representative of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency Board of Directors and the appointment of William D. Pesh to serve as a member visual arts of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency Board of Directors. The committee will receive oral testimony for Eve Makahaga's nominees at this public hearing. For the viewing public's benefit, the committee will continue to accept written testimony that will be made a part of today's public hearing record. So joining us this evening are Simone E.P. Bollinger and William D. Pesh who are E. Magahaga's nominees to serve on the board of directors of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency upon their confirmation. In our presence, we also have uh, Ms. Gillette Leon Guerrero, the director of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency. So thank you all for joining me at this confirmation hearing. Before we receive and hear oral testimonies from each nominee present at their confirmation hearing, I'd like to first set some general rules of conduct for those who are virtually appear, uh, excuse me, participating in today's virtual hearing. The conduct of the hearing shall be as follows. All participants must abide by rules of conduct and quality assurance standards, including broadcasting from a quiet room with little to no interruptions. The use of virtual backgrounds is not permitted. All participants must broadcast from a room that has adequate lighting, specifically to ensure that a participant's face is not backlit, but visible at all times when speaking. When speaking, please ensure that you are unmuted and that you are speaking clearly into your microphone. I will moderate this hearing by recognizing each participant before presenting their oral testimony. Before speaking, please clearly state your name and title for record keeping purposes. The order of questioning will begin with, um, well, it's me. So it will begin with me and it will end with me. <laughs> um, oral testimonies received shall be kept to the substance of the issues on the agenda. The personal inference as to the character of a nominee, senator, or any individual testifying is not permitted. Any violation of this general rule of conduct will be removed from our virtual public hearing by the host. I ask that all participants, well, generally we keep our comments uh, and testimony to about five minutes, but it's just us, so we can, we can go a little over if we need to. <laughs> 
And let me move forward on this virtual public hearing. So half a day. A board or commission member's work involves much volunteer time and commitment and provides an important link between the public and agency, the legislature and the governor. Each board is unique in its purpose, mission and role. It is especially important that members be familiar with their board's governing statutes or other authorizing directives to understand the framework within which the board must operate. I want to call upon Ms. Simone E.P. Bollinger to provide her testimony to serve as a member on the Guam Council on, on the Arts and Humanities Agency Board of Directors, and then receive testimonies from individuals who are confirmed to participate in this nomination. And as I mentioned earlier, I want to acknowledge the director of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency, knowing that she is very busy with other obligations, but has made time to participate in today's virtual hearing. The committee has received written testimonies, all supporting the nominee's confirmation. For the record, we have received positive testimonies from a Dr. Judy Flores, CAHA board member, Teresita L. Perez, faculty uh, and coordinator of the English placement test at the University of Guam. From Victoria Lola Montcalvo Leon Guerrero, the managing editor of UOG Press. So with all of that out of the way, I'd like to recognize Simone E.P. Bollinger to provide her testimony and general comments to the committee and um, with that, to just remember to unmute yourself and begin with your name for record keeping purposes. Hafade Todas Hamzu. My name is Simone Ifihenya Perez Bollinger. Um, and Sidus Masi, Madam Chair, for the invitation to speak today as I seek confirmation to the Kaha Board representing the literary arts. I'd like to briefly introduce myself and my connection to the arts as they pertain to this position. I'm currently the English department chairperson and faculty senate president at the Guam Community College. Both roles require capacities that would be beneficial to the board, creating and overseeing budgets, developing strategic plans, and listening to stakeholders and voicing concerns to a broader audience. Both of these roles have introduced me to GovGuam policies, practices, and networks. I look to this position as a chance to continue to support GovGuam efforts as they pertain to my background, experiences, and calling in life. That calling revolves around the creation and use of Pacific literature by and for all people living on Guam. I believe in cultivating or writing voices to further develop a sense of regional place as a proud tomorrow, I believe we have stories and perspectives that are worth sharing. As an educator, encouraging the use of Pacific literature is important to me because I believe all curriculum in our schools should be place-based and culturally relevant to prepare future generations to meet the needs and challenges of our island, but also to inspire belief that positive change is possible. If we aren't teaching students to observe their environment, read perspectives by those who share their experiences or document their own experiences, then we are missing a great opportunity to develop literacy skills, critical thinking skills, civic engagement and inspiration for the future. Some of the local authors that inspire me are Desiree Timingla Ventura, Verna Zafra, Shoban McManus, Johanna Salinas and Miguet Bavakwa. What they and many other writers have taught me is that the stories and talent exist here, but more infrastructure for supporting and publishing authors is needed. Kaha has supported me personally in my literary endeavors. The idea for my first children's book, Magwaizazu Sinana Denzi Tata, was born at a Kaha workshop my sister-in-law and I attended as part of FESPAC in 2016. I used what I learned in that work workshop to write a second book, Un Haani Zensi Ena. I've read the books many times in different schools on island, and there's no greater joy than when a child looks at the pictures and says, hey, that looks like me and my cousin, or I know that beach. Representation matters. 
I've co-edited and published two anthologies of Pacific literature, Local Voices and Kinalamtin Give Pacific Insights from Oceania. Both of these books were published in partnership with Kaha, specifically Jackie Balbus, who works there. Kaha has supported me, and as a board member, I hope it to in turn support other local authors. Some of the ideas I presented at Kaha's Literary Arts and Spoken Words Focus Group this past August, August were establishing writing groups or guafacs. And this is a term I picked up from Dr. Laura Souter, who is leading a guafac that I'm currently part of. Um, establishing an alternative press, supporting writers from greater Micronesia to develop and expand our regional sense of place, and supporting Chamorro language revitalization via literary arts um, curriculum and texts, Gifino Tsamoru. I know that I have an idealistic outlook, but one of the most important things art does is inspire belief in a more ideal future. This is my greatest hope for Guam and one that I would work toward as a member of the board. Sidzu Osmaasi for your time. Gosh, I'm forgetting my own rules. <laughs> I had to unmute myself. Um, it was very good to hear your testimony, uh, Sidzu Osmaasi, for that. And um, I now I'd like to recognize uh, Ms. Gillette Leon Guerrero, the Director of Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency, to provide her testimony and general comments. And then um, I'll have a few questions to ask. Uh, if you could go ahead and begin. Okay. Thank you and good evening. My name is Gillette Leon Guerrero, Executive Director of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities. And I'd like to say that I wholeheartedly and without reservation support the confirmation of Simone Bollinger to the board of Kaha. Uh, she has an Im impressive background as um, she talked about a little bit of, about herself. Uh, her most recent educational degree was a master's of education in language and literacy from Harvard Graduate School of Education. And she is employed by uh, the Guam Community College where she just told us you're the faculty chair um, she's and she's held several leadership positions at GCC, and she's an author and editor and has also worked with the Guam, the University of Guam Press. Her community services service includes the founding of a nonprofit organization that supports local literary communities. And her relationship with Kaha includes being a literary arts publication delegate for the 12th Festival of the Pacific Arts in 2016, as well as a past grant recipient. Uh, most recently, she participated in developing our strategic plan by serving on the literary arts community focus groups where she had some very good ideas that I'm hoping that we're going to be able to move forward. Um, it's nice to have someone. I also publish local books and uh, I'm interested in stories and place. So um, I have a little personal interest in this. <laughs> Um, her knowledge and expertise will greatly contribute to Kaha in enhancing our literary arts programming, which is, I, I, I don't think it's very big, but I think they have had um, programs in the past, um, uh, spoken word projects and mainly through their grant program. But I'm hoping we're gonna be able to expand uh, some of those to actual programs that Kaha actually runs. Um, and while I've only met her, you virtually, Simone, I'm looking forward to working with you uh, as you help us bring Kaha's arts programming to the Guam community. So thank you. Very good. And uh, you highlighted, uh, of course, many of the fine qualities that Ms. Bollinger brings with uh, her. So um, I will go ahead and read uh, one of the testimonies and uh, enter it into, into the record that way. It will be part of the committee report, all the testimonies that have come in. But um, this one had, I thought, some, it helped highlight some of the qualities uh, that you'll be bringing to Kaha that I thought were important to note. So it says, uh, esteemed Senator, it is with great excitement that I write this letter in support of Simone E. P. Bollinger. Her nomination as literary arts representative to the Kaha's board of directors was an extremely wise move. I have known Simone for five years and can bear witness to not only her devotion to writing and to the written word, 
but to her passion in bringing to light otherwise marginalized voices on our island. Her work at FESPAC as a Publications Committee delegate was my introduction to her work as a writer and to her life as a professor to our island's college students. She talked of how she integrates Pacific literature into the lives of these freshmen, how they are inspired to write and give voices to their experiences, and of how extremely important this work is. As vice president and co-founder of Tatsugi Motna, one of the island's few nonprofit organizations committed to local writers, Simone co-edited and published one of the organization's biggest projects to date, which was the book In the Lambton Gi Pacifica, an anthology of Pacific, writing of Pacific writers and of their voices. The running theme here, I guess, is voice. Simone does not highlight her own, although she is a published author in her own right. She prefers instead to uplift and to help others be heard. Therefore, I feel she is incredibly gifted and inspirational as a choice for the board of directors for CAHA. She has my unwavering support. Not only do I teach English at UOG, I'm also a president of the aforementioned, aforementioned sorry, Tatugi Motna and consider myself a stakeholder in the island's growing literary community. I write this letter of support from that perspective. Sidus Maasi, a Teresita L. Perez, faculty and coordinator of the English placement test, the divisions of English and applied linguistics at the University of Guam. So as I mentioned, um, I thought that highlighted many important qualities in serving as a board member and for an entity like CAHA, having that heart to lift up others, to find opportunities uh, to create these spaces where their voices are heard. I mean, that's incredibly valuable and that's absolutely the type of person that we need. So um, I had wanted to be able to share those, um, those sentiments that uh, Ms. Perez was sharing with us. Your many fine qualifications have been listed in, in one testimony or another. So we very much appreciate those. Those will be excellent uh, qualities that you bring with you. There uh, was one, and I may have missed it being heard. So if it was listed, um, I'm just going to look at this as an opportunity to highlight it a little further. And that is being a curriculum developer for one of the Ifino Tomorrow projects. Could you discuss that a little bit, what kind of project that was and what your role was? Sure. And thank you, for the testimony, um, Ms. Gillette, and for reading Terry's testimony. It's humbling. It's very sweet to hear. Um, that project was part of an ANA grant out of the MARC, the Micronesian Area Research Center, um, whose goal was to develop a curriculum, a post-secondary curriculum for the four institutions that teach the Chamorro language. So University of Guam, Guam Community College, um, the College of Northern Marianas, and University of Hawaii. And um, while each of those colleges teach Chamorro, there's no um, set curriculum that guides what is taught in, in um, the different levels. And so uh, when students transfer between colleges, there's their, uh, the, the, the idea was to ensure that, that the skills are being built upon um, regardless of the institution. And so that was a, a very fun project to work on. Um, Dr. Faye, Antalan was the principal investigator and it brought together a lot of the Chamorro teachers from the University of Guam and then representatives from each of the other um, institutions involved. And we spent a couple of years going through existing curriculum and creating a um, and creating a curriculum which also turned into a textbook which is currently with UOG Press right now. Um, but the, but um, is, and is also being used already at um, GCC. It's up to the different instructors at this point since there's no actual textbook yet published. 
uh, but the curriculum itself and the division of the skills and the competencies at each level is has been spread across all universe all, all the institutions well, thank you for sharing about that. You know, I was actually working at the University of Guam um, it, when that project was going on. And so I used to see some of the members like uh, Dr. Faye Antalan and uh, Dr. Pavakwa and, and others that were part of that project all the time. And I, I knew about it generally, but I didn't quite know all the details. And so I think it's such an important thing that it is unifying the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, the University of Hawaii, where uh, Dr. Antalan has taught for such a long time, and the University of Guam and GCC. Um, bringing all of that together, I, I think is so important. Um, perhaps you, like myself, we hear about uh, people talking about the differences between Guahan and the Northern Mariana Islands, and the fact that there's uh, some some commonality in the way that it's potentially taught or, or uh, worked with uh, or spoken, I think means a lot to the students because partly because it, they're such a mobile community anymore. Um, I kind of think um, if we took a census, a true census, I'd be very curious to know how many people from the NMI are on Guam and how many people because there's a lot of us from Guam in <laughs> NMI, so uh, yeah. So uh, thank you for sharing about that. And again, I think it speaks to the range of what you offer um, in your experience and uh, what your interests are. Do you have uh, any particular thoughts on some of what you'd like to see in literary arts or other fields of art as a board member, um, things that you might be interested in proposing? Yeah, you know, um, programs that really support, as, as writers really, um, and what we've been doing with our nonprofit is supporting, giving support via re, uh, writing groups and reading groups and places to get feedback um, and, and places just for writers to enter into the sphere of publishing. Uh, many of the writers that we published in the two anthologies were, had never been published before. Um, and just so the process of, of submitting your work, getting, receiving feedback, updating it or revising it, um, that can be overwhelming for, for um, writers, novice writers and, and turn them off. And so um, one of the big things that is important to me is finding ways that we can support those writers. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the idea of the Guafac, uh, which I just love, it's this idea that we're all weaving our own parts of this shared net or this shared experience um, and the shared representation in this case, right? Uh, the shared voice, but they're all different. All the patterns are different. Um, and so that's one of the things that the more writing groups that we can get started and if we could find a way to have it um, institutionalized within Kaha. Uh, I think that's a great, a great step. Um, an alternative press, I think, is really important. Um, Victoria Lola at UOG Press does great, but man, there's, there's a lot of people who want, who want to be published and there's a lot of people writing. And so um, having more opportunities uh, for that, I think, is important. Um, you know, book fairs and allowing places for authors that people are self-publishing. Um, and so, uh, or creating, um, you know, there's the Guam bus, you mentioned the get. And so uh, other ways to support people who are really doing the work of publishing for themselves, of marketing themselves, of showing up to uh, local fairs and festivals to sell their books, things like that, I think is really important um, to build in as a way to support those authors. Um, and then also I think and I don't know exactly where the lines between CAHA and Department of Education, for example. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know yet how much work can be done between the two entities, but I feel like I, because I'm a teacher, everything that I think about uh, in terms of making change or mobilizing or doing something, for me, it all starts in education. And so the younger we can get 
students writing, working in publishing, if they're zines, if they're chat books, uh, if it's online at this point, right? Because, you know, right now the market is interesting. No one's buying books really because no one's going to bestseller or the Guam Museum where UOG Press, you know, has a lot of their books. And so what is it, what is it gonna look like in the future in terms of online? Uh, my daughter is in second grade and so she's doing online learning and she goes to Carbolito. And so there's a great, her teacher is great and she's giving a lot of links for authors reading their books um, online. And so there's video clips, they're so easy. Um, and the teachers are really incorporating this into the curriculum because they know that they can't sit necessarily and do story time with the kids anymore, especially the young ones. And so there's all of these new pockets of growth, potential growth um, because of COVID and, and then because how COVID is going to change, um, you know, education, writing, all of these different fields. Um, at GCC, you know, we struggled with uh, online education and, and our, and our um, students and their preparedness for that. But after this, which was this great forced experiment, we know students can do it. And we know that students are going to appreciate this change. We're looking at this for however long. And so this is really gonna change our, our trajectory at JCC, especially in the English department. Um, and so how we can link to have to, with, with these other educational organizations and how we can work together to provide curriculum, which in many cases are just books and texts and stories and children's books or anthologies, those types of things and, and build curriculum around, around them um, is something that's been very, very important to me and something that I've been working on for a long time. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure if it was through Kaha or Humanities, but when they were doing the spoken word um, and Melvin Wampat was doing the Sinaganta Youth Movement, that was just amazing. And I remember going to the uh, poetry slams at Tizen when they would, to, to prepare the, the winners to go off island to the, to the Brave New Voices poetry uh, competition. And it, gosh, the way they mobilized the students, the way they, students were so excited to be there to, around, to discuss writing, to hear their stories, that kind of stuff I think is something that needs to come back um, and, and needs to sort of be this voice, uh, this vehicle for students to, um, to just grow, right? And so for me, I'm always looking at the youth, but then, we have also a lot of um, writers who are older, who are, um, you know, my age, older than me, and those writers are also need that kind of support. And um, what that support looks like changes, and where they can get it. And 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 with a lot of older writers, um, older, I mean, you know, not children, not not kids in, in high school. Um, that that's. That and the, the potential for using online resources and online groups and Zoom meetings, um, it can be very low cost, but have a very big impact. And so um, supporting writers at all levels and all ages in different ways, and, and then also providing ways to publish or ways to um, have these author reads or spoken poetry nights. Um, that's something that, those are both two big areas and lots of ways to do that. There are lots of ways to do that. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking about. Well, I love all of the things that you mentioned. And I, this is a very exciting time for Kaha. Kaha has been such a staple for our community for such a long time, enriching us in so many ways. And um, with the particular just mix and dynamics of the people who are part of Kaha right now, I think that any organization should always be building upon past successes to, you, you know, continued success. And I think the formula is just right with the people that are there, uh, including, you know, once we get to your and Bill's nominations in place, um, you know, you mentioned so many possibilities that maybe Kaha hasn't offered in the past. And that's one of the exciting things about any society is it constantly evolves, it constantly creates new art forms or has new ways of, of sharing them or expressing them. Um, and so I wrote down a, a few notes of what you were saying that, you know, there may indeed be the ability to, um, 
to bolster up uh, somehow an alternative press, uh, maybe, maybe in partnership between Kaha and Gita and working with, you know, um, whether, whether you guys take that on or work with some other organization that might be interested in it. And then with the, uh, the, the speaking, you know, and the, the sharing of the stories, it reminded me at, early on at the beginning of COVID-19 and everybody going into their state of emergencies, I remember seeing some of these new offerings. And one of them was being able to hear stories being read from space by astronauts. I just thought that was really innovative, right? And as you're saying, we uh, most all of us have cameras with, uh, excuse me, phones with these cameras and video capability, which was unheard of when I was a child. I mean, um, yeah, it, it was a completely different, different world in that sense. But there's just so much potential. I was just thinking of that astronaut situation being taken locally here about having a Tatasia seafarer in their sackman, you know, and, and reading a book or, or talking story. And just all the possibilities while somebody's weaving, while somebody, you know, is molding young minds. And it's true, um, I have this conversation a lot that art is such a vehicle and it does so many things, or at least it has the potential to do so many things for society. Art has uh, the potential to do so many things. And as you were saying, and uh, I'm sure everybody here knows, it reaches out to people in ways that other mediums do not. You know, it's one thing to get a PSA from, uh, let's say a health official, and it's another to have a history professor tell you some statistic. But when you listen to slam poetry about history, uh, like uh, Mel, uh, Melvin Wampat Borja's um, his group did and others, it's powerful and people absorb it in, in different ways, ways that they may have resisted.
Okay, so um, I think this entire week we've been having uh, different different entities have been having uh, internet issues. Um, I say it's the rain. A lot of the internet companies say that the rain doesn't interfere, but <laughs> regardless. Um, so what what I was saying though was um, arts can be such a powerful tool for the youth, uh, for young adults, and for all of us really. You know, we just respond differently than we might to a lecture or to a typical PSA. But if it's spoken through um, slam poetry or if it's a mural on a wall, uh, something like that, that message can reach us differently in a way that will actually absorb rather than resist. So I did appreciate, as I mentioned, um, all of the, the possible visions uh, that Kaha could be working towards and, and what you work towards yourself. Um, so the only thing that I'll ask as well is because you are so active in organizations and other things, uh, would you have any issue with recusing yourself um, if, if a situation should arise that somebody um, you're close to or as part of your organization that would be applying for a grant there or a situation like that? Yes, I imagine that happens, right? On Guam, such a small island and the artist circles are of course very small too. Um, and yes, if I feel that I can't be impartial um, or that it, um, or even if I feel like I can be impartial, but maybe it's still not um, appropriate, then I would definitely recuse myself. Um, Senator Kelly, could I mention one last thing that I didn't um, fit in? Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I spoke about younger generations because as an educator, I'm always focused on them. Um, but another really important generation, I think, is um, our Manamku and the storytelling aspect. Um, I, I'm recent, I'm currently working on a, on a piece right now. And to, to work on that piece, I use Guampedia to get some background information. And Guampedia has these beautiful videos of, they'll have an article. This one was on Santa Maria Kamalin. And then Saina Malia has a video at the bottom. And to hear the stories and, and the process of collecting stories about Santa Maria, um, all through a very narrative um, driven uh, way of speaking and way of talking, it, opened up for me uh, so many ideas and great thoughts to include in my piece. And so I think that part of the literary arts, while, you know, generally we're focused on publishing and, and spoken word and um, finding venues for storytelling and finding ways to support storytelling and making that part of um, part of our um, our part of our one of our, our resources for writers, for students, for people, for those who are um, into history for, you know, there's just so many ways that that type of um, resource can really uh, invest in our community or help our community. Um, and so I just wanted to mention that too, because storytelling is so beautiful and it's such a nice way of connecting people and teaching us about our past and our history, which I know um, Senator, Senator Marsh is important to you, um, but, <laughs> Um, and, it, and it can't go without being said. I, I didn't want to leave that out because that's really important. I'm glad you mentioned that. You know, um, in a discussion I had recently with Joey Certeza, who's the vice chair of the board, um, we were talking about art in the schools and that's something you also had mentioned. And you know, there's just so much potential there um, to bring artists um, into like into the classroom, I think, well, of course, this is a different world, but even if it's by Zoom, yeah. you know, or it's through the PBS University, I mean, in some ways, that's really ideal, because it can continue on, like you're saying, getting to watch the video over and over mm -hmm. and getting it to be a tool that can be used and used. But those kind of moments where the kids can be inspired by, real, you know, artists, I say real artists, but I mean, you know, I think there's something to be said for the inspiration that kids would have by somebody who is out there producing art. And some of this is also, you know, all forms of art. 
uh, not just the visual art, but literary art and um, just, you know, all of the different forms of it, including the importance of having this transmission. It's a traditional art form and it's so important. It's, it's uh, both a part of the culture, but it's just a beautiful, important part of that intergenerational connection of listening to your elders, but hearing things from them that you don't get to hear really from anybody else and to hear them potentially in the first person. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I very much see potential in those sort of things as well. So <clears throat> before I, I, uh, I risk it too much with my spotty internet, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I will go ahead and conclude this confirmation hearing for Ms. Simone E.P. Bollinger to serve as a member on the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency Board of Directors. And the time is now uh, 6.18. So thank you so much for accepting the nomination for your testimony and uh, for the director being here to provide testimony as well. And now we will go ahead and begin the confirmation hearing for Mr. William D. Pesch. So I want to call upon Mr. William D. Pesch to provide his testimony to serve as a member on the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Commission, Board of Directors, and then receive testimony uh, from individuals present to participate in his nomination. The committee has received positive written testimony supporting the nominee's confirmation. For the record, um, testimony for Mr. Pesh was submitted to the committee from Dr. Judy Flores. And again, I'd like to acknowledge the director of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Agency, uh, Director Gillette Leon Guerrero, who will provide her remarks after Mr. Pesh's testimony. So with the format, out of the way, I would like to recognize by E. Makahaga to serve on the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Board of Directors. Please unmute yourself and present your oral testimony and general comments to the committee. Senator, thank you very much. I um, just want to first of all make sure you can hear me. We have a delay, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to assume you can hear me. First of all, I want to say that Simone Bollinger is a tough act to follow. Um, a very impressive. Again, can you uh, can you hear me? Hmm. You. A little spotty, but I can't hear you. Okay, I'm just going to continue um, in hopes that you will. First of all, I've got to say I apologize. I'm doing this from home and um, I'm a little nervous. I'm going to keep this very brief because my grandson is going to wake up from his nap at any moment. And if you want, you don't want to see a four year old running back and forth in my living room, which could happen at any, any moment. Um, I, I, first of all, am very appreciative of uh, Gillette Leon Guerrero's uh, nomination of, of myself to be on the board of CAHA. Um, just by way of background, I came to Guam in 1976. Uh, I was a high school biology teacher. I taught for three years and then went back to law school in Washington, D.C. And I've been back on Guam practicing law since 1983. Um, humanities has always played a big role in my life. Um, from, from my early years, teenage years, um, I, I enjoyed art. I was somewhat of a, I loved to sketch and paint, although I've lost all that over the years. I kind of got distracted with other things. And um, I've always enjoyed history. And I have been the recipient of two grants uh, uh, from Guam Humanities Council. One was back in 1992-93 when I did a, a, an exhibit on the history of, of Japan and Micronesia. 
Um, I travel throughout Micronesia um, gathering information about the Japanese, uh, the Japanese administration, not, not World War II, but this was prior to from between World War I and World War II. Um, it was a fascinating experience. It culminated in a uh, exhibit. I think I had over 250 um, pictures and artifacts that were on display. And then a few years later, um, really as a result of that, uh, uh, I was, um, Don Rubenstein recommended that I consider being in the Micronesian Studies program. And uh, I found that fascinating. I was, it took me a while to get my, my degree, my master's degree in Micronesian Studies, but I did it. And again, exposed me to, to so many new things and, and to, to what, um, just how many different cultures we have in the area, the contributions of those cultures. Um, sometimes it involved art, um, uh, learning about art, art history in some of the areas. It, it was just, it was a fascinating experience. Over the years, I've also written a number of articles on, on, on different matters. Um, most recently, between 2014 and 2017, I had a weekly column that I wrote uh, called Love, Life and the Law. Uh, which was more centered on, on law, but looked at different issues. And uh, after that, um, uh, I'm, I'm currently sitting on the, the board for uh, Humanities Guahan. And I've been doing that for the past year or so. And so uh, I've never forgotten my humanities, my love for humanities. I think if I have any, any um, quality that I, I take uh, to potentially take to the, to Kaha would be my, my sense of curiosity. I love to learn um, and I like to learn from other people. Uh, so um, it's, it's really with that curiosity that um, when Gillette recommended that I think about this, um, I was curious and I thought, yeah, I think this is something that I, I, I would enjoy. And um, I think with time and I, after learning experience, I think I'll have uh, some contributions to also make. So with that said, again, I'm appreciative of, the, of this nomination and um, I'm humbled by it. And again, uh, thank you very much. Excellent. You know, um, I think where we met was in the Micronesian Studies program and I too, um, I think, you know, being, being returning students and can go a couple of different ways. One, you can get through it maybe more quickly, but if you're working and, um, you know, you have family obligations and other things, um, I also, uh, I, I say I took the scenic route. <laughs> you know, I took my time uh, to get through the program. But, you know, I think that, I, I, I think I took seven, I think I took seven years, Senator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and um, uh, so I just wanted to make that clear, you know, that, that I've known you for a real long time and, and have appreciated you and, and the way that you contribute to the community and the way that you uh, think about our island and our region. Um, I think that you are working in so many different ways to really um, make those beneficial sorts of contributions. And in thinking about your nomination and your background in Micronesian studies, I was thinking, and, and you discussed it a little bit, that we live in a region that has so much, diff well, different types of art, different types of art forms from chanting to visual arts, to weaving, to carving, um, you know, cooking, culinary arts. I mean, the list goes on and on and, and not just Micronesia, but Southeast Asia, of course, and, yeah. and all of this. And so I think that educational background, having lived here for so many years, it's, it's not mandatory, but I do think it brings uh, something with it, some experience, some understanding, some depth of knowledge about potential and possibilities and what does exist there. And one of the things that I found, and you perhaps have, um, have come to similar realizations, is art within our region, I think, can be a unifier. You know, we do talk about the struggles of um, discrimination and things like this. Um, there are a lot of efforts in Hawaii that are going on to try to get past some of those issues of discrimination. And I think art is one of the ways that they're, they're bringing people together to either talk about some of those uncomfortable issues in plays or otherwise. But when I was teaching 
Fatina Si Lati or Lati Carving, where we were exploring together the possibility of how Lati Carving might have been to try to recapture it, I learned so much about how in um, Yap Island and the outer islands of Yap, to use modern terms, right? But places like Fais and Wuliai and then farther out, Okinawa and uh, the, just elsewhere, that they had these traditions of stone pillars and carving stone. And so, you know, we were able to have this be something that people could see themselves in, whether they were from Guam or not. And so I, I just think that there's so much potential in what you offer um, and not only in the Micronesian studies, but I, I do think that that can be a strong element to it. Yeah. So um, I, oh, I, I did wanna ask about with the Humanities Guahan. So this is an interesting nomination because your nomination wouldn't go into effect until January, I believe. So when is the government of Guam ever like a few months ahead of time? <laughs> but um, apparently we're very organized sometimes. So um, I was curious with the Humanities Wahan, are, are you still going to be on the board then or is that when your, um, your board um, seats would, mm. would end? No, I still, I still will be on the board. I want, I want to be up front. I, I still have a couple more years on uh, with them. So um, I wasn't, to, to be candid again, I wasn't sure how the two would meld together if that poses any type of a problem. Okay, and, and I'll leave that up to, um, yeah, the, the, the director to figure out. But I think actually, in a lot of ways, it maybe has some very good potential. We are a small community. We have a limited size number of organizations. And I think what better than to know very directly firsthand what both of the humanities entities are doing so that they're running in tandem, they're coordinated, they're uh, doing different roles, whatever it ends up being, uh, that may end up working out very well, I think. So um, yeah. I, I hadn't noticed that until uh, just before this hearing started. I don't think it'll be an issue. I, I think it can be something that can be quite beneficial uh, actually. So we will continue to sort that out, but I, I, I think that that's going to be okay, but <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, just uh, you, you spoke about um, your background and, and some of what you hope to, to do or see uh, is there anything further that you'd like to see about um, types of art to promote or? Um, well, you know, like I, I, we, we were talking before about the fact that we really Guam today is a, is a multicultural um, um, place. We have many different cultures here. And you also talking about how um, art can unite. And so I really would like to, to see if amongst all these different um, uh, cultures that are here, how that has influenced art. Um, have do we see some influence? Let's say from 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 traditional Chamorro art creeping into other ethnic groups' uh, artwork. Um, so that's one thing I think would be kind of fascinating. And and plus uh, to see a number of shows about different. Um, uh, the artwork of different ethnic groups. Um, I, I, I like the idea of trying to expose as, as many people in the community to art and to the humanities. And uh, something I'd like to see in, and, uh, is maybe bringing it to shopping malls, um, to bring it to the mall where, we ha where it can be on display for a period of time so that more and more people are, are getting exposed to it. Um, so th that's what I, I, I'm interested in, is just see a broader exposure and uh, of the arts to the community and, and take advantage of, of the different um, technologies we have. I'm, this, this whole thing with, with um, the pandemic situation is exposing the older generation a lot more to the technology. And I, I, I'm, I'm thrilled with it. I mean, I, I think it's so interesting that it, the potential is there to use this technology to really, um, uh, to get information about the humanities out to everyone. So 
I think that's where I'd like to go is I'd like to see it infiltrate more areas of, of, of the community and, and more uh, approaches within the community to expose people. I, you know, that sounds very exciting. And uh, Art, as you're mentioning, it's, it's very dynamic. And, um, you know, I, I don't know the, the true history of about, I, I do for storyboards in Palau, but as far as uh, when storyboards became an art form on Guam, you know, maybe it is because of interaction with sure. Palauans, but I don't know Absolutely. that history. But I think having maybe even some discussions, I mean, obviously it's up to the board to decide, but I would find it something really beneficial to the community to see the hundreds or thousands of years that they've been interacting with each other and how these art forms have impacted and influenced and inspired one another over time. Um, I know when I sit down with weavers, they'll talk about the, the Yappi style and the Palawan style and, and like this. And, and I think those could be some really beautiful moments that it highlights you know, are weavers here? Um, but but um, all of the influences and all of the weavers here and they're, they're different art forms. So yeah, I, I mean, I always get excited. I always look forward to these uh, confirmation hearings with Kaha because we get to talk story about art, <laughs> which I love doing. So I appreciate that very much. Now your other hat is being an attorney. So I imagine with recusing yourself, you, you, you've got that down covered about when would be the right time to recuse yourself and, and not. Yeah, I, I have no problem. If there's any potential um, conflict, uh, absolutely, I would recuse myself. And, and again, I think there's a possibility because I sit on um, Humanities Guahan board, there may be some times when I'm going to have to um, step back um, in matters that may affect humanities go on. So I'm, I'm very prepared for that. Okay, very good. That's very good to hear. So um, I'm thankful my internet has, uh, has stuck it out off of my phone. So <laughs> I'm going to not take any more chances though. And I'll let you get to your, to not waking up your four-year-old grandson as well. So uh, I'll go ahead and conclude this unless there's anything else you want to add. But uh, I will conclude no. the confirmation here. Okay, for Mr. William D. Penn to serve as a member on the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities Board of Directors. The committee will continue mm -hmm. to receive written testimonies for the next few days for either nominee. Please address your written testimony to the Committee on Heritage of the Arts, Parks, Guam Products, Hagatnya Revitalization, Self-Determination and Regional Affairs. Written testimonies may be submitted by email to office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org or may be delivered physically to the Guam Congress building. Sidus Maasi, for your attendance and participation. You know, I'm just realizing, I didn't did I give you a little No. I didn't give you a little ten. No. Okay, so... Rewind that. I'm just going to tell them to rewind that. I am so sorry. I was having such a conversation, and in my phone, I only see one person at a time. So I only saw uh, uh, Attorney Tesh. So let me give you a chance, Director, to give your testimony for Mr. Peck. Okay, I'll be brief, but I, I did want to um, come up. Let me just read my remarks first. Um, uh, do I need to say my name again? <laughs> my name is Gillette Leon Guerrero, Executive uh, Director. Sure. Oh, okay, that's right. Okay. Uh, well, I wholeheartedly and without reservation fully support the nomination of William Pesch to the Board of Directors of the Guam Council on the Arts and Humanities. I've known Bill for many years and know him to be an intelligent, committed, and honest individual whose contribution to the island includes not only his legal services, but his community service, which includes uh, serving on the board of uh, Kaha sister organization, Humanities Guahan. Um, I've also known him as a past recipient of the Guam Humanities Council when I was executive director there. And I remember one project, uh, Praying Against the Tide, that you did. Uh, uh, anyway, that was one that I, I, I really remember. Um, 
Bill was also a teacher, university instructor, instructor, columnist, historical research, legislative aid, and legal counsel to the Department of Education. He has a master's of arts in Micronesian studies and a Juris Doctorate from the American University in Washington, DC. His expertise and experience will greatly enhance the council's development of programs that target underserved communities, as well as provide guidance and or review for the development of board and operational policies and procedures. We're very pleased to have Bill nominated for this position and look forward to working alongside him to bring the life enhancing aspects of the arts and humanities to all the people of Guam. But I'd also like to say that a lot of things that he mentioned in his testimony, uh, we actually have plans uh, and uh, uh, in our strategic plan that we're, we're currently working on, um, the whole multicultural idea of having different uh, groups, but we also had uh, ideas of taking, of bringing, contempt, bringing together contemporary and traditional arts uh, exhibits so that you sort of, you know, don't make any distinctions between different forms of art as well as, you know, contemporary and um, traditional as well as, um, different uh, multicultural. Uh, so that was one of the ideas. And then the other idea, that other thing that we're working on is uh, upgrading our website. We're currently working on that so that we can have podcasts and, and be able to reach out to uh, a wider audience with uh, programs that are actually also Simone's uh, ideas. I'm thinking of readings that we can have, you know, instructional uh, videos that are accessible uh, widely. Um, let me see, I did, I wrote some notes here, yeah. Um, now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to rush, sorry. <laughs> and then also the making connections, making, making connections between the different um, communities and sort of investigating, you know, how we all connect is really one of the, the areas that we're also looking into. But we do have a lot of plans. Uh, we also hope to have, um, uh, move into our office, uh, a new office and have gallery space. Uh, we're just waiting for the, the GSA to finish that. And if that happens, then we will have a, a, a place, actually a meeting place that we can actually use uh, to have small events and um, book readings and uh, exhibits and lots of things. So I'm really excited to have uh, uh, Bill nominated and to work with him again. <laughs> Uh, to to bring the arts and the humanities and also to have more of a little bit more, like you said, of the humanities infused with the art uh, for Kaha. So I guess that's it. Thank you. <laughs> I <laughs> rushed like through that. <laughs> and I apologize. It's uh, the way my phone set up. Like I said, I only see one person at a time and I uh, just focused on Bill and forgot everything else. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to just read a, a couple of sentences from Dr. Judy Florence as well, just to have it be put into the record. And so she mentioned, um, she is also a Micronesian Studies graduate. I'm not sure if they met there. They probably knew each other uh, long before that. But she said, I have known attorney Bill Pesh professionally for many years as a very competent family law practitioner. He is also a collector of my art and of other local artists. This combination of professionalism as a practicing attorney and as one who appreciates and supports the arts is a perfect fit for the qualities desired for the Kaha board. My testimony is in favor of his confirmation. I look forward to working with him. Sincerely, Judy Flores, Kaha board member. Okay, so with that, I can now get back to closing, <laughs> but I'm glad we were able to get those last two testimonies in there. Thank you. So I will read the time all over again. Um, the time is 6.41. And just to remind everybody that you can send in written testimonies for the next several days, and you may submit them to my office by email at office.senatorkelly at guamlegislature.org, or you can present them physically at the Guam Congress building, or, well, that would be the way to get it to us quickly, yes. So, Sajuas Maasi, for your attendance and participation in today's virtual confirmation public hearing, 
Today's hearing is now adjourned. Sidhuas Maasi uh, for everyone for your attendance and participation in today's virtual public hearing. The time is now 6.42. So uh, thank you all for hanging in there and uh, all the internet ins and outs and have a good night. <laughs>